So the question is, this is from Luke Starkenberg. So the question is, can nature keep up with human caused emissions? It sounds like it can't keep up because the CO2 levels keep going up. Yeah. So go ahead, go ahead, Sterling. And maybe Gregory can also hit on this as well. Uh, and the answer is uh, no, nature's not taking all the CO2 out of the atmosphere that we're adding to the atmosphere. It adds, it takes about half of it out. Um, and then the question is, so what, it, you know, it, unless you think CO2 is dangerous, um, it doesn't matter if CO2 goes up. In fact, as Greg and his group point out regularly, it's good at one time CO2 levels, you know, not at one time over the history of the earth, over the earth's geological history, which is a lot longer than 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 years, which we're always obsessing over, CO2 levels have been much higher. And in fact, CO2 has largely drawn down over time, gotten compacted into carbonaceous rocks, some of which we have uh, opened up when we, uh, when we grind them up for concrete, limestone, and things like that. And uh, we've released it back into the atmosphere. Most plants evolved at times when CO2 was much higher. Um, if we don't capture all the CO2, uh, that's okay because, in part, well, the new CO2 is good for plants, but also because CO2 only captures certain irradiation bands in the atmosphere, and they're already covered largely by water vapor. So more CO2 doesn't necessarily lead to more warming. Yeah, Greg, uh, Sterling has add to that. Well, Sterling's right. Yeah, we're not, nature's not keeping up with the amount of CO2 coming into the atmosphere. And I, I'm okay with that. If we're looking, again, we're looking at corn, which is C4 crop. Now, C4 crops evolved in a low CO2 environment, and they don't need as much CO2 for optimum growth. So it might be that uh, perhaps, and I don't know, I'm not going to state this as a fact, but it looks like for corn and C4s, maybe 350 or 400 parts per million are optimal for plant growth, but put a CO2 meter in a cornfield. Let's just say, okay, we're at 420. Put a CO2 meter in, a, in the middle of a cornfield on a, a windless day in August, and you'll find that CO2 levels, instead of 420, they're down at 320, 300, really, really low levels. And that's because the CO2, the corn is just sucking. CO2 out of the atmosphere, it's fascinating. Uh, but if you get on a tall step ladder and get up out of the corn, it'll be back up to around the ambient 420 levels. Uh, so if we had even higher levels for corn, uh, then the corn would, would actually grow much better, even if their optimal levels levels were at 400 or 350. The C3s are much more, are, are mo most of the crops that are being grown and we're no, nowhere near optimal carbon dioxide levels for those. So they'll, they'll continue being uh, turbocharged for, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, what are we going to be 200 years till we double or more than that before we double CO2. Um, and so it's a good thing. What we're seeing year after year, we're seeing crops. And in my book, I capture the top eight crops in the world uh, and they're tons per acre that are produced and they're just breaking records year after year after year. And it's from the coldest countries to the hottest countries like India. India's crop growth, and, and they used to have terrible famines and uh, crop failure. They don't have it anymore. They haven't had it in, in decades. It's because of a number of different things. Uh, GMO crops are, are now being used that uh, handle drought better, but it's also CO2 fertilization means that they handle plants handle drought much better. They don't need as much water. And so we're, that's why we're seeing part of the reason we're seeing that the, the Sahel, there was a new UN report claiming that the, the, there's desertification in the Sahel. Heck no, it's just the opposite. 200,000 square kilometers of the Southern Sahara, the Sahel are now lush grassland and farmland. They were desert 60, 80 years ago. Yep. And so they lie about these things flat out lie and it's disinformation campaign from people we should trust. And, you know, we got, we, we saw this, I think people had their eyes opened in the COVID era that, you know, we found out that there was straight out disinformation and misinformation uh, and people lying about things that, that they knew were, were incorrect. And I, I think when they, at the end of this, we'll look back and maybe, maybe it might be just pretty coming pretty soon. But they'll be exposed that it's what's going on in climate change science, what passes at science, 
it, it will make the COVID misinformation look, it will pale in comparison because we mm. see it. I know Sterling shaking his head. Yes, we see it every single day. It's, just, it's not, you know, I wish it, I wish it worked so rife in climate science. Um, but, you know, it seems that the, the, the more government gets into funding science, the more fraud there is in science uh, to gather big money. I mean, because it's, it's not just climate science. I, I think I saw uh, research that showed about half of the studies published in medical journals uh, have been shown to be false. They went through peer review. They got a lot of headlines and now they've had to withdraw them or uh, issue, uh, you know, what is on the view they issue legal notes. Oh, you know, they, they issue science notes say, no, well, no, this, it turns out this isn't right. Um, and that's because there's lots of big money in this. And so it's corrupted science. It's not the pursuit of knowledge. It's the pursuit of funding. And, yeah. disaster, and, disaster, and disaster garners funding. 